Good day, everyone. Welcome to our discussion on Ukraine with Dr. Fred Kagan from the American Enterprise Institute. We're really fortunate to have him today. I am Jim Hake. I'm the founder and chief executive officer at Spirit of America, and I'm very happy to see so many of our supporters on the call today, including members of our board and board of advisors. And uh, for everyone, thank you very much for having this conversation with us and for your support. Uh, as background, Spirit of America is a privately funded 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, this year is our 20th anniversary, and we've been active in helping Ukraine defend its freedom for 10 years now, since the original Russian invasion in 2014. Uh, since the full-scale invasion in 2022, our focus has been on providing non-lethal assistance to help Ukraine's soldiers. And our goal is to save lives and stop the suffering at its source by helping Ukraine stop and defeat Russia. Uh, today, we've raised about $60 million towards that end and provided a wide range of non-lethal assistance to Ukraine's military, uh, all based on needs identified by and in coordination with the U.S. military. Think of it as filling gaps between what Ukraine needs and what uh, government is doing. So our millions of dollars of support has had billions of dollars of documented impact, uh, not even including the countless lives that have been saved. So if you're looking for a way to help stop Russia, help Ukraine defend itself and its freedom, uh, we would love to talk with you uh, after today. Uh, our team is also active in Taiwan and the Middle East. And uh, we really represent private citizens working together with America's troops and diplomats to preserve the promise of a free and better life. And if you're also looking to join a coalition of the can-do, we'd also love to talk to you. Uh, for housekeeping today, if you have a question, uh, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Uh, please submit them there. And I can promise you we won't get to them all because for those of you who registered and already provided questions, we have about two hours worth and we have uh, 27 minutes here. So, but uh, please submit them and we'll do our best to get back to you after today. And with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Fred Kagan. He is the director of the Critical Threats Project at AEI, the American Enterprise Institute, uh, former professor of military history at the US Military Academy, and uh, just a, a great partner in defending freedom and democracy around the world. So uh, Fred, thanks so much for being with us today. Jim, thank you. I, I just want to say how um, uh, grateful I am to you and to Spirit of America for all of the amazing things that you have done now for 20 years, supporting U.S. troops around the world and now supporting uh, our partners and our allies. Uh, Spirit of America is a fantastic organization with a terrific mission, um, and I just I couldn't be prouder to be uh, working working with you guys on the on the common task of of helping us defend our interests and freedom around the world well it's very kind thank you fred we the feeling is mutual uh we are on the same team doing different things of course and uh you know standing up for what america stands for is about as near and dear to, to all of us as uh it can possibly be um so i i want to we have a lot of great questions as i mentioned I want to start off with the why question, which is why did Putin invade? Why did he start this war? Why the invasion in uh, February of 2022? Thanks for starting there, because it's it's an important touch point. Uh, the Russians have worked very hard to, to get people confused about that. And uh, I think people have gotten confused about it. Putin, this is this is a naked war of aggression. And Putin's objective is to subjugate all of Ukraine and reincorporated into the Russian Empire. He was as explicit about that as you can be in the article that he published in 2021 that was the justification for the invasion, and he's been clear about it ever since, if you actually read his words and understand what they mean and what they say. <laughs> Putin <laughs> re explicitly rejects the idea that there is any such thing as an independent Ukrainian state or that there ever can be any such thing as an independent Ukrainian state. He rejects the notion that there is any Ukrainian identity. Uh, from Putin's perspective and the Kremlin's perspective, Ukrainians are just confused Russians who've been led astray. And their their great historical task is to uh, regather the Russian lands, uh, use, using to use a very old uh, Russian, Russian history phrase, which is relevant because I think Putin sees himself in a certain way as the modern Ryurik, 
uh, refounding a uh, re refounding a new Russian state that'll that'll be the the new Russian Empire. This is this is what this is what this war is about. Um, this was not a war that was triggered by some NATO non-existent NATO threat. Um, this is not a war that was triggered by the U.S. being mean to the Russians. This is a war that was triggered by Putin's conviction that the next step in his journey toward the reconstitution of the Russian Empire was the conquest of Ukraine by force. And that's what he launched this invasion for. And he will not stop until he is either defeated or achieves that objective. And so that's the why. And he must have also assumed that he could get away with it and succeed, right? Yeah. So on the one hand, he, he and his military badly miscalculated uh, how hard this would be. And they thought that they were going to roll over Ukraine in short order. Um, and apparently the U.S. intelligence community also got that wrong and thought that they would roll over, Russians would roll over Ukraine in short order. Um, that turned out not to be the case. Um, and of course, Putin calculated that we wouldn't do anything that mattered. Um, he turned out to be wrong in both of those calculations, but uh, those were his going in assumptions. It's an interesting counterfactual to ask what would he have done if he'd realized how the Ukrainians were going to fight, if he'd realized how his army was going to perform, and if he'd realized what the U.S. actually was going to do. Um, but he didn't, and so he uh, launched, embarked on this journey. And then having discovered that this was going to be a hard fight, he simply bore down. And at every step when he's had an off-ramp and he's had an opportunity to pursue a lesser objective or or try to uh, pull back in some way, he's doubled down. And that should tell us a lot about his propensity for any kind of, uh, you know, nego serious negotiation or settlement before he recognizes that he's actually been defeated on the battlefield. And what is the current situation on the battlefield? So the current situation is unfortunately favorable for the Russians because of, largely because of the six-month delay in the renewal of U.S. military assistance uh, and the fact that the Ukrainians have uh, run very, very low on artillery shells and very, very low, especially on their defense interceptors. And so the Russians have been leaning in for some weeks, the months now, actually, uh, to take advantage of these Ukrainian vulnerabilities. And they were able to take the town of Avdivka. Now they're exploiting that, uh, uh, that success in that area. And they're also pushing uh, west from the city of Bakhmut um, in, in what is actually a more alarming drive because they are threatening to take a very important small settlement called Chasiv Yar um, that would put the Russians in a good position to threaten the what would be sort of call the fortress belt of major cities that uh, are the bulwark that defend eastern Ukraine um, from further Russian aggression. So the Russians are advancing. Um, the Ukrainians are defending um, in very difficult circumstances. The Russians are take, trying to take advantage of the last, hopefully last weeks of the real um, advantage that they have in terms of artillery numbers and um, air uh, Ukrainian air defense capabilities uh, to make as much gains as they can. And the Russians are also preparing for major offensives later this summer uh, that we expect will follow uh, this one. Um, it's important to note that the Ukrainians are also struggling with manpower challenges of their own and have just passed a mobilization law that will help address those but won't fix them. Um, and that, so that's another challenge that the Ukrainians are facing that are is making the situation now very tough. Uh, that having been said, um, we so I, I have the privilege of overseeing the Russia team at the Institute for the Study of War. Um, and our our combined assessment is that um, as the aid flows in, the Ukrainians will be able to stabilize their uh, lines and stop this Russian offensive and very likely be able to receive and ultimately stop the summer Russian offensive as well, although they probably lose some ground um, in doing so. So the situation now is very tough uh, for Ukraine, um, but we we don't think that the Russians are going to be able to blow things open and um, really unhinge, you know, big parts of the Ukrainian lines. And when do you think the military assistance package will start to have a really meaningful effect on, on the battlefield? 
if it doesn't start to have a meaningful effect on the battlefield in the next few weeks, then we all have a big problem. Um, <clears throat> it's, I, you know, I don't know what exactly the U.S. had stockpiled and how rapidly we were able to move things once the order was given. We've, U.S. officials have said that we started moving stuff right away. I assume that that's true. It still takes time to move large amounts of artillery into country, of artillery shells into country, and then get them distributed to frontline units and all that stuff. Um, especially as the Russians are attacking transportation electric, and electrical infrastructure and trying to make it hard for that to happen. So I think we're we're still going to have some some time before we really start to see the impact of the initial surge of aid, which I expect will be primarily munitions. Um, and then it'll take, I think, a considerably longer period of time for new vehicles and other larger and more complicated systems to start to show up um, on the battlefield. So I think we're going to see the aid beginning to have an effect, hopefully, within the next couple of weeks. But then uh, the real effects will, I think, be, become visible over the coming months. And, and one of the questions that's uh, been submitted again for, for everyone on, uh, if you have a question, please use that Q&A button on your Zoom toolbar. Uh, so one of the questions, Fred, is about the uh, manpower situation in Ukraine, the mobilization. And what's your assessment of uh, you know whether Ukraine can provide the the uh, soldiers necessary to continue this uh, continue the fight. Ukraine can can mobilize um, a lot more soldiers than it than it has, and it it can mobilize a lot more uh, soldiers than the uh, recently passed mobilization law provides for. Um, look, Ukraine has adopted an interesting, I'll say that um, approach to manpower policy in this war in that it has been shielding from conscription the cohort that most countries would have mobilized first, uh, which is the the group of 18 to originally 27 year olds. Now uh, they've reduced conscription age to 25. Um, and that was a decision the Ukraine's made early in the war. Um, and that is one of the factors that has limited the availability of Ukrainian manpower on the battlefield. Um, there are several ways of looking at this, but one way of looking at it is to say that the Ukrainians have effectively kept for themselves uh, half generations worth of reserve uh, that they can mobilize in principle as required to put a lot more troops on the battlefield. So the manpower challenges that we're seeing Ukraine face are to a considerable extent a function of Ukrainian decision making rather than inherent limitations on what uh, Ukraine can mobilize in principle, which is good news, uh, because it means that there is a pool of manpower that the Ukrainians can mobilize. Um, there's a lot of argumentation, a lot of controversy about the size of the mobilization that they've just completed. Um, I think it's not likely to be sufficient uh, to address their manpower needs. I also understand, and I think we all need to understand with a greater degree of strategic empathy than we have hitherto shown in our discussions about this, that uh, this is, of course, one of the most difficult and emotional subjects that any state at war has to address. Whom are you going to send to fight and how many? Uh, the Ukrainians have thrashed this out. Um, and I think we also need to recognize that, you know, if you, we've people have been aggravated, the Ukrainians, for not calling up a big mobilization in the past, you know, few months. When you have no weapons to give your guys and you have no confidence that you're going to get the munitions that you need for them to be able to fight effectively. You don't really have the ability to induct and train and send to new units, hundreds of thousands of new conscripts. Uh, I don't know what the point would have been of having them pay the massive political price at that time of doing a huge call up. So I think they've, they've made a start at this. I think uh, General Sirsky, the commander in chief, has done a number of other things to work to mitigate the manpower challenges. But the bottom line is they have a larger reserve that they can draw on, um, which I expect over time they will. And I think it'll be easier uh, politically and emotionally for them to uh, persuade their people uh, to make that additional sacrifice as it becomes clear that they're going to have the weapons and equipment that they need to be able to uh, fight and have a, have a chance on the battlefield. And how far does the military assistance package take Ukraine? 
Well, you know, uh, <clears throat> I don't need to tell you that war is contingent and path dependent. So it's very hard to answer questions like that. I know that when the package was drawn up, it was intended to be passed in the fall of last year and to last Ukraine through this election uh, in the US, so through November. So it was meant to be about a year's worth of stuff. I also know that it's a bigger package than any of the previous packages that we've given Ukraine by a lot. So it, I expect that it will take Ukraine through this year. Um, how far into 2025 will it take Ukraine? That's that's going to depend on a lot of factors. Um, it's not going to win the war. No one has ever said that it would. And I think this is this is a talking point that opponents of supporting Ukraine have have been beating up on. And it's just there's a straw man here. No one has ever suggested that this aid package by itself would let you Ukraine win the war. Um, more more assistance will be required. We can talk more if you want to about how over time the requirement for massive amounts of USA can be reduced without compromising Ukraine's ability to fight. But uh, this package, bottom line, should get Ukraine through this year um, and into the next uh, presidential term here. And uh, then, yeah, we were going to have to have another discussion about what kind of continuing support Ukraine is going to need. I know there are uh, infinite scenarios of, of what might happen and how this might play out. But what is a uh, good case scenario of what will happen in the war and, and how it will how it will end? The Russians have a number of very obvious advantages here. Ukraine has a number of advantages as well. And I think that it is a very it is very much within the realm of uh, plausible scenarios that the Ukrainians stop the current Russian offensive, stop the future Russian offensive without losing uh, really strategically vital ground, and then find themselves in position uh, late, you know, in this coming winter uh, to begin counterattacks and counteroffensive operations and begin to uh, once more to liberate strategically important territory. Um, it's just, you know, it's hard. The truth of the matter is, again, war is very contingent and path dependent. Can you, can you imagine a circumstance in which Ukraine liberates all of its territory? Sure. I can. Um, I'm not prepared to put a probability on that. Uh, do I think that Ukraine can liber can liberate the territory that is most urgently, most strategically and operationally significant? Yes, absolutely. I think that can certainly happen. Uh, can, but can I imagine scenarios in which the the Russians are able to hold on and stop Ukrainian advances and this you know either the war just sort of continues along these lines indefinitely or the Russians begin pushing west? Yes, I can see that happen too, especially if Western and particularly U.S. willingness to continue to support Ukraine wanes. Um, so there's a let me put it this way: before the aid package was passed, there was a very wide forecast cone that ran all the way from Russia defeats the conventional Ukrainian military and, and pulls up on the on the eastern NATO borders, all the way to Ukraine begin successful counteroffensives. With this aid package right now, those those worst case options have fallen out of the forecast cone. <laughs> so I don't think that there's any pl plausible scenarios in which the Russians defeat the conventional Ukrainian military um, at this point. How far can the Ukrainians go? It remains to be seen. The Russians have a lot of vulnerabilities, and it's important to recognize that the Russian advances now result in part from changes and improvements the Russians have made, and and we 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 have to avoid talking the Russians down too much. Uh, but we also have to recognize that they, these Russian gains result very heavily from the limitations uh, that have been imposed on Ukraine by the. Uh, resource starvation uh, that we've uh, that we've put them on, um, and those will be mitigated. So, there, are op the options are still very wide, but fortunately, some of the worst options I think have fallen out of the forecast cone for now. And one one of the questions that's come in is uh, how much are the Europeans stepping up to fill the gaps left by the United States? Europeans are really stepping up a lot, and by the way, so are our Asian allies. <clears throat> And it's important that we recognize that this 
it's not just the Europeans who understand how important Ukraine uh, is. The Japanese, the Taiwanese, the South Koreans, the Australians have also been uh, providing a lot of assistance within the limitations of their own constitutions because they they know <clears throat> this is important. But the Europeans have been leaning in. Um, in some cases, the Europeans have been leaning forward to give the Ukrainians long-range strike capabilities that we have not been willing to give them, um, particularly the British uh, giving the, the Ukrainians a lot of storm shadow missiles, the French giving them the scalp missiles, which are their equivalent. A lot of air defense systems have come out of Europe. We're having now Patriot, system, Patriot interceptors coming in from European allies. Europeans have given them a lot of armor capability, a lot of vehicle capability, a lot of ammunition. And we're seeing a lot of initiatives in Europe really to expand the European defense industrial base and the support that they're providing to Ukraine. So the Czech initiative to get hundreds of thousands of rounds of artillery uh, produced and sent to Ukraine this year um, is underway and moving. There are drone coalitions. Uh, it, it really is quite significant. And it's important not we it's not a an appropriate talking point just to say the us is carrying all this burden the europeans are not stepping up the europeans are stepping up uh i'd like to see them step up more i'd like to see that i'd like to see the germans get over their their issues with the taurus missile and send taurus missiles to ukraine um i'd like to see more european investment in, in defense budgets and so forth but um the europeans have been carrying a lot of the burden and really stepping up a lot especially in the window when the us has, has stepped back so this is over the long term, I, the thing that that gives me confidence that there's a trajectory where the US, if we can see the Ukrainians through the next couple of years with relatively high levels of support, the combination of Ukrainian defense industrial based development, because the Ukrainians are leaning into this and European and, and Asian defense industrial support for Ukraine, I think over time can very significantly reduce the burden that the United States would have to continue to bear here. Um, but we have to we have to help long enough for that to become possible. And uh, we're, you know, there have been many suggestions uh, along the way. Uh, people su saying that a ceasefire uh, could is possible. The conflict could stop where things are. <clears throat> there would be peace. And in response to that, you've said. There are only two options for what happens in Ukraine. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yeah. Um, look, we've 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 collectively gotten certain notions in our mind um, <clears throat> in the U.S. and the West generally that are more complicated than war actually is. Most wars end with one side winning and another side losing. I would say the overwhelming majority of wars end that way. They don't end in some Dayton style negotiated accords and i think this war is likely to end the way most wars end one side is going to win and the other side is going to lose and the reason i say that is because the russian objectives were not to conquer lands in eastern ukraine as i said at the front the russian objectives were to, to and remain to subjugate ukraine and uh, putin is not going to abandon that aim and putin's successors are very unlikely to abandon that aim so there could be a temporary ceasefire at, during which the Russians will mobilize um, to restart the war, which is exactly what happened in 2014. And this is this is part of the whole problem with this discussion is, um, you know, definition of insanity is doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting a different outcome. We've tried negotiating with the Russians. We've tried ceasefires with the Russians. And what we got was the full-scale invasion. So... The only way that you can actually have this war end other than with a Russian victory is with a Russian defeat. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that Ukraine wins back every last square meter of its territory, but it does mean that the Russians will have to realize that they have been defeated on the battlefield and that there's not any plausible way for them to recoup their losses on the battlefield by renewing the conflict. That's what we have to focus on. Um, there's no basis for agreement. There's no basis for negotiation when one side rejects the very existence of the other side. 
On what basis would a Ukrainian government negotiate with a Russian state whose position is that there is no such thing as Ukraine? I don't see room for common ground there. And I think that this whole discussion about ceasefire is, it's it's largely just, we're living in a fictional universe in which we're just, we don't want to pay attention to what the Russian war aims actually are and what the Russians say every day about how they see the Ukrainians. And I also want to take on another point that's increasingly being made, um, <clears throat> which is really, well, I won't use adjectives. Um, there are people who oppose aid who are saying that the U.S., we're, who are parroting what is a Russian line, which is that the U.S. is just prolonging the suffering of the Ukrainian people. And if we would just, you know, end, you know, end our support, then the war would end, the fighting would stop, and, and peace would reign. And the problem is, you kind of need to look at what's going on in Russian-occupied areas of Ukraine right now, which uh, ISW uh, analyst uh, Carolina Hurt has written about uh, brilliantly in a paper uh, on the Russian occupation playbook, and recognize how much violence the genocidal Russian project and the Russian ethnic cleansing project is inflicting on Ukrainians in occupied territory every single day. You also have to reflect on the fact that Ukrainians are not going to submit tamely to a Russian occupation in that circumstance. And so the fighting won't stop and the war won't stop. What will happen is the violence on the Ukrainian people will, ex will expand dramatically and you will have probably the largest insurgency in the world break out. And the, and the violence and the fighting will just take another form, but it'll be a form in which many millions more Ukrainians are suffering much worse than they're suffering right now. So this false notion out there that we could somehow pull the plug and that would end the war and bring peace is false to fact. And it really glosses over the viciousness and brutality of what that the Russians are inflicting on Ukrainians in occupied territory every single day. It's a great way to put it. And it also overlooks the multiple ceasefire agreements that were uh, agreed to in 2014 and 2015 that Russia never honored. There were thousands of Ukrainians that were killed during those ceasefire periods. And then here we are today. Um, a a uh, last project, there are a few questions, several questions about the broader global implications of, of Russia's war on Ukraine. Uh, and I'll uh, try to get it, uh, a group of them in, in this way, Fred, uh, both at you know, the Critical Threats Project, also the Institute for the Study of War, you all uh, look at threats uh, beyond Ukraine and Russia, of course, whether that's with uh, China and Taiwan and the Middle East and so on. So if you could uh, just pull back a little bit and look at that global picture and say what you think is at stake in Ukraine in terms of these other areas, not just with, with Ukraine. <clears throat> Briefly, since I know we're, we're coming up on time, uh, there are two things. One is U.S. credibility, in particular Western credibility, is on the line here. Um, there are people who are saying that we can't, can't afford to support Ukraine because we need to be prepared to defend Taiwan. I find that problematic in many ways. But uh, one way in which it's problematic is if we show that we are unwilling to spend money to help Ukraine defend itself, what does that say to Xi Jinping about our willingness to spend our blood to defend Taiwan? Right. It encourages aggression. That's one, and that there's just there's just no question. And this is, of course, why the people who are most keenly interested in our briefings a lot of the time are Japanese, South Koreans, Taiwanese. They they understand this very very keenly, and they tell us this all the time. The other aspect is this: Russia is now part of an entente with Iran and North Korea and China that is that is parallel with the World War II axis and in many respects is more alarming because they are interacting and coordinating better than the axis partners did in World War II. This is the Iranian drones in Russia on the one hand, but then the flow of technology and resources and material back to Iran from Russia on the other hand. Same thing with North Korea, something like 3 million artillery rounds have gone from North Korea to Russia. A lot of food aid and other kinds of technical assistance have gone from Russia back to North Korea, and the Russians vetoed the renewal of the UN sanctions monitoring program for North Korea. And of course, everybody is, all, all three of them are warping the Chinese more and more into their orbit. We have to recognize that, that this these threats are not isolated. And, you know, you, it was, you, it's a bad joke, but it's always true. Ukraine is not Vegas. 
if Russia wins in Ukraine, Russia will be stronger. If Russia is stronger, Iran will be stronger and North Korea will be stronger. Uh, I, I, I wrote about this in an article that I, that I gave the title that I stand by. You can't be an Iran hawk and a Russia dove. You can't be a North Korea hawk and a Russia dove. This is a coalition where this, that, that is mutually reinforcing. And the best way to prevent a circumstance in which Iran and North Korea and China are not only emboldened, but also strengthened, is to help the Ukrainians defeat Russia now. Right. Yeah, it's uh, well, 100% uh, how we see it. And as you know, we're active in many of the same parts of the world that uh, AEI and, and uh, ISW is taking a look at. And we see Russia's fingerprints behind just about every bad thing that's happening in the world, either directly or indirectly. And every one of those problems will get worse if Russia prevails in Ukraine. Um, uh, a last question for you. Uh, you know, you're pretty familiar, you're quite familiar with what we're doing at Spirit of America to help Ukraine. What's your advice on what we should be doing as we look ahead? Well, I mean, the first thing is, is you know, God bless you for what you're doing and keep doing it, uh, which is incredibly important. Um, and I think we we all need to get the message out and we all need to help Americans understand uh, what what is at stake here and why it is so important uh, to help partners like Ukraine uh, defend their own freedoms because they're defending our freedoms too. Um, I think uh, House Speaker Mike Johnson uh, put it very well and, and movingly uh, when he you know, said he has a son go in the going to the Naval Academy and uh, want would rather send money to Ukraine now than send his son to fight the Russians later on. Uh, I think helping Americans understand what what is at stake, why this is an American interest, uh, why why we should be involved in this uh, is a very important thing that we all need uh, that we all need to work on, because I think we always need to answer that. It's not just that people are criticizing. If you're going to ask the American taxpayer to shell out a lot of money for something, right. the American taxpayer has a right to ask, well, why should I do that? And, and I think, unfortunately, for a long, long time, people have not provided clear enough answers to that. So uh, we, you know, we take that requirement seriously. And I, I know you guys do too, as well. And I think that that's something we really need to try to lean into. It's a great point. And for everyone on the call, um, we're going to email you with a couple of ideas about how we can address what Fred just talked about and helping better make the case, helping more people understand what's at stake in Ukraine. So uh, please expect to hear from us on that. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all the questions. We'll we'll pull those together and do our best to get back to you. And Fred, uh, I, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for everyone, uh, both the uh, you're able to support as a private American the Critical Threats Project at AEI and the great work that they're doing over at the Institute for the Study of War. So if you're not already doing that or not familiar with them, please take a look. And if you're interested in uh, helping us at Spirit of America help Ukraine defend its people and its freedom, please join with us. Uh, I think you all know where we are at spiritofamerica.org. Uh, with that, Fred, thank you. Uh, see you again in person soon. And uh, always great to talk. Thank you so much, Jim.